This podcast is brought to you by the Kansas City Barbecue Store, the official provider of barbecue supplies to listeners of Pitmaster. If you haven't visited the Kansas City Barbecue Store in person or on the web, they literally have every supply that you can think of to make you not only successful at competition barbecue, but also the king of your cul-de-sac. From smokers and fuel to rubs and sauces, the Kansas City Barbecue Store has everything and anything you could want. And get this, as a listener of the OVS Pitmaster podcast, you can get 10% off of your order during National Barbecue Month, which is May, by using the code PITPOD, P-I-T-P-O-D, all caps, for online orders at www.thekansascitybarbecuestore.com. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it. So visit the Kansas City Barbecue Store.com today for all your barbecue needs. Welcome to another edition of Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast. I'm your host, Luke Darnell, and today we're going to do a question and answer session with some questions that I garnered through the social medias. So let's get to it. Uh, Thank you very much for your questions and thank you for listening. I can't tell you how much of how important that is to me and that, you know, the podcast has become something that I love. So I really do adore all of you and appreciate you being here. So the first question that I'm going to answer is from Travis Murphy. And it is whether it be rising fuel, meat and general goods costs or something completely different. What do you think is going to be the hardest thing pit masters and organizers will have to push through in the coming one to three years to not only keep the sport going, but growing. That's an interesting question, Travis, that I think a lot of people are struggling with right now. Um, Prices for everything are going up given the current, everything that's happening in the world We're on the brink of European war or we're in a European war again. Supply chain issues continue to rear their ugly heads through COVID and other things. So in order, I think we got to try and get the price down a little bit. I think you're going to see more participation in the single meat contests. Um, And I think people are going to stay closer to home to cook. It's, it's becoming less and less economical to drive across the country and cook. Um, Just a few weeks ago, Kim and I cooked a contest in Indianapolis and we didn't take the big trailer because Frankly, towing it nine hours just didn't seem like a great idea. So we took the J3 and uh, rented a U-Haul and had a great time. It was was a lot of fun. I just think that managing the cost of it, but also just maintaining a momentum uh, and keeping the sport going is, is the order of the day. That's what I think. So next up, Robert Burnett. Is it true that wearing sandals at a comp, no matter the weather conditions, increases your overall score by 15 points? I'm going to respectfully say it does not. I'm pretty sure you're referring to Brad with getting basted. And I'm actually a big opponent of anyone that cooks in sandals because, frankly, it's a huge safety hazard. You're handling hot coals and hot things and hot grease. And if you're in flip-flops or you know, an open shoe. It's a major fight in the OVS trailer all the time because Kim loves to cook in flip-flops. And I just think it's, I think it's ridiculous, but that's just me. Next up. When from Kevin Bongard, when getting to the wrap stage and you're adding the goodies for brisket and pork, does it make a difference if you wrap in foil or place in a steam pan and cover it with foil? That's an interesting question, Kevin. I don't know necessarily know that I know the answer. I know that people do it both ways with great success. I personally am a person that I like to wrap it in foil and I like to wrap it tight and not let any air in there. I want to I want to make that environment as airtight as possible and really just keep all that moisture in there. However, I know very a few pit masters who are very, very successful with just putting it in a pan and covering it with foil. So I think that's actually one of the charms of the hobby that we all engage in is that there are many different ways to do this and many different ways that it can be successful. So you do you, boo. 
So next up. All right, Bill Hayen. <laughs> Your question was, I need to know how to cook chicken. It went from my best category in 2020 to my worst this year. Uh, well, I would point you towards the, the Barbecue League website where my chicken video has recently come out. It's fairly simple. It's an easy process, and I think it explains it pretty well. So give that a shot, buddy. My good friend Chris Pinnell from... Hell yeah. He cooks with Little Bear. He's a lot of fun. How early is too early to start playing music and what song gets played first? Wow. Man, there's a thousand different answers to this. Um, playing music, there is no time. You just have to be respectful of your neighbors. I start playing music at 4.50 whenever I get up, but it's in my earbuds. Until 7 o'clock, in which case I think it's then acceptable to play music on the speaker. However, it is rare that we put our music out there loud for everyone to hear, although it's getting more and more that way, just because I like music on the back porch when I'm out there with the jambo. So, I, and what song? Oh my god. I don't know. And one of the things that we've been thinking about coming out with is an OVS Spotify playlist, because... It has songs that both Kim and I love, and the criteria for that playlist is very tough. We both must love the song. If we don't love the song, then it doesn't make it. So it could be a variety of things. I generally want to get the day started with some sort of hardcore 90s hip-hop track, kind of set the tone for my mind and get me in the right place. So that's how I would answer that question. From John Wade with Two Drummers Smokehouse and Two Drummers Barbecue Supply, uh, Butcher Shop and Barbecue Supply down in Williamsburg, Virginia. If you guys haven't checked them out, you need to. A uh, lot of good stuff there. At what point internally is the best to wrap? Or is wrapping based on external indicators only? I personally have been taught by many people that you wrap on color and you pull on feel. So once you get the color that you want and you're happy with that, then you wrap it. Then you can start, you can stick a probe in it or, you know, get a little bit way in through your wrap and see where you are. I don't necessarily wrap on any certain temperature. And I don't think a lot of people do because I don't think it matters really what temperature it is at that point. Because you're going to wrap it in foil, you're going to bust through any kind of stall. And as long as you get the color you want... Then you can cook it to the feel that you want. Let's see here. Let's go back to ah, Lance Thompson. Real butter or parquet? Reasons for or against using either or use a combination. I use both in my program. Uh, I like real butter in my chicken pan. I like real butter in my wraps. But I like parquet when the meat's on the smoker to kind of Slow the coloring process down, add a little moisture to the top. Uh, so I think that if you use them in combination, or I know a lot of people that just won't use parquet because of its parquet. I, again, I think that's a question that really illustrates what's so special about this hobby and that you, there's a thousand different ways to do it. So experiment, find out what works for you, buddy. Be good to go. Earl Hill, any tips on mitigating rib blowouts in the wrap? I'm going to answer this question with kind of a, <laughs> why would you want to? Um, I think that those ribs, especially on the big bone side, when they blow out, that's a great indicator to me that the ribs are done, especially in a competition setting. So I kind of want them to blow out, in all honesty. I want to see it. I know there's... Stuff out there that people say that they do, like leaving a piece of the membrane underneath or on the bottom of the rib that prevents it. I mean, I, I personally want to see it blow. If I see a rib blow out, then I know I'm home. What else do we got here? Some more questions. Another one from Travis Murphy. Now that multiple events have happened, what is your take on the single meat contest? And do you think they are a good way to help entice teams to come to competitions by offering them on Friday evening? I personally have grown very fond of the single meat contest. I really enjoy them. 
I, I, I love doing them on a Friday. It gives me something to do and it gives me a chance to get some more rib points and to, to compete. So if I'm already there, if I can get there Thursday and be all ready, I, I love doing them. I think they're fun. I think it's barbecue related. I'd much rather see uh, a KCBS single meat ribs contest on Friday night than whatever this KCBS steak thing is going to be. Um, some people may not like that, but sorry, that's where we are. I don't, uh, I don't want to do a steak contest. I'm there to cook barbecue. So let's, I like them. I'd like to see more of them. I'm going to start cooking more of them even when they're, you know, on Saturdays and it's easy to go and do. So I think it's a good thing. I think it's a lot of fun. So I think I'd like to see more of those. Uh, okay, next question from my girl, darling Nikki, who I want to give a special shout out to. We spent some, a lot of time together a couple of weeks ago in Blairstown, New Jersey, and uh, she's just fantastic. So what up, girl? What tips do you have for convincing your spouse not to divorce you over competition barbecue expenses? Oh, that's a difficult question because, you know, you you keep plugging money into this and plugging money into this. And it's funny how much it can snowball because then you end up with a vehicle and 85 cookers and you're like, what have I done to myself? Uh, Really, it's just having your spouse involved and making sure that, you know, they know how important this is to you and that you treat it with that importance so they can see how important it is to you. Um, The other trick is like when you go to a barbecue class at a barbecue store and you want to buy a cooker, buy the cooker, but then tell them you want it in a raffle. (laughs) The old raffle, I want the cooker in a raffle excuse goes a long way. That one's a lot of fun. This podcast is brought to you by BarbecueData.com. BarbecueData.com is your one-stop shop for all of your barbecue competition data. Historical data, calls, wins, placements, Everything under one roof. It's a great way not only to track yourself in the standings, but also to track how you improve your scores from year to year. Listeners of this podcast can receive 20% off of a new subscription to BarbecueData.com with the code PITPOD. That's one word, all capital letters, P-I-T-P-O-D, PITPOD. So check your team scores, check on others, and do it all on BarbecueData.com. We have a couple serious pork questions here, but I do need to answer some more funny questions. So my friend Jerry Stevenson from Redneck Scientific, he's a touch of a smart ass, but he asked me a series of questions kind of in a rapid fire uh, manner. So I'm going to go ahead and answer those. Uh, So here you go, Jerry. Best electric knife? Couldn't tell you because I don't use one. I I just, I think they're what whatever. Who uses an electric knife, man? How can you even feel what that piece of meat's like when you're holding something that's vibrating like that in your hand? So I can't answer best electric knife. Sorry. Favorite sad country song. That would be Don't Take the Girl by Tim McGraw. I don't even think that that's up for debate. Fantastic song. Devil's Candy, which is Jerry's term for the burnt ends, is awesome because there's really nothing else like it. Um, having a perfectly cooked burn end. Oh my God, they're so great. But the problem is, is that everyone's, especially in the tense interpretation of what those are, is so varied that I, I just can't see ever putting them in the box again. I don't, I mean, I cook them every time. They're great every time and I'll eat one and it's great. I'll eat another one and it's not so great. And I'm like, well, who knows what's going to happen. So I've eliminated that variable. Next Jerry question, your favorite one gallon jug or five gallon bucket? And this is referring to <laughs> emergency bathroom practices in the trailer. And I have to say that, you know, for me, neither one. Uh, I'm definitely not going five gallon, gallon bucket route. If I have to, I will, I will institute pee jug, but it's only in an extreme situation. <laughs> and the last question, <laughs> food critics as judges. Yay or nay? I'm not sure I... If you're asking me, are judges food critics? Uh, I think they act like it. But I think most of them aren't qualified to be a food critic. 
Are they qualified to be a barbecue judge? Sure. Um, but maybe let's keep that in perspective. Now, whether we're going to have food critics as judges, eh, that's a different story. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird question. But Jerry's a weird guy. So thanks for those questions, buddy. Other questions. Let's see here. What is your favorite barbecue team name? And who has your favorite logo? This is so hard because one of the best things to do at a barbecue competition is to go and listen to all the team names and you get to, you get to hear some really great ones and some really clever ones. And, uh, I think one of my, my favorite names out there is Oinka Doodle Moo. <laughs> I just love that. It's fun to say. And, uh, their pit master is, uh, is a hoot. Oinka Doodle Moo. Like a good job, Mark. In terms of logos, there's a lot of great logos in barbecue, but I will tell you that all of my favorite logos do not have a cartoon pig in them. I am against cartoon pigs. I'm against flames. I think we can all do a little better, be a little bit more clever. Sorry if that offends anybody. I just, I'm not down with cartoon pigs. Uh, we started with one and it quickly went away. So, that's my take on logos. If I had to say what my favorite logo would be, it would probably be ours. I really like it. It's classic. Um, I don't ever see it changing. My brother did a really great job coming up with it. I really enjoy it. But there's there are so many good ones. Big Papa's new one out there is really good. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. All right, let's jump into these pork questions because there's a couple here. Then I'm going to answer probably together. So we'll start with Luke from Tire Smoke, Luke Leggett. Thanks, buddy, for the question. Also, thank you for all your help out in Indianapolis. I could not have done that contest without you, at least not as effectively. So I want to just thank you, thank you publicly for everything you did for us. New pork rule, good or bad? What are the new options and how do you think they will score? The new pork rule for me is really just not that big of a deal. I don't, I don't see how, how it affects anything really. I mean, yes, you can trim your butt smaller. And if I, and then the next question is by Joby Hambrick, which says, have you made adjustments with the new pork rule? And yeah, I'm cutting my butt a lot smaller. Um, you know, I'm keeping the money muscle and coming back over the tubes and basically coming down on top of the bone and then cutting out the bone and, and cooking it like that. Um, does it weigh four pounds? I don't know. I quit weighing them now because I don't have to. I want everything the same size. Do, you know, is it good or bad? I, I don't know if it's cutting down waste. Now I'm not having to cook the rest of that butt and I was not really doing anything with it. Now I can just save that meat and cook it here and do other things. Is, is what are the, you know, new options, you know, there's new ways of fr people are trimming it and stuff and doing, I've seen pork steaks out there a few times, maybe even cooked them a few times, um, scored well once. Didn't score well the rest of the time. Kind of abandoned that that project. Um, a lot of people out there are talking about collars. Um, I haven't bought a collar, but I can't imagine I would cook it any differently than I would. It's just a marketing term. So I just, I, I don't see how I wouldn't just cook it the same. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, in the past few years, we've just started seeing boxes just full of money muscle. And that's what this has become. Uh, would I like to see the pork roll change even further? I don't know. I think it would be neat if you put in there that you need to have money muscle and one additional preparation. I think that would be okay. Um, it would change the game a little bit. Probably bring back bigger butts. But essentially, all it's done is made it a... One big meat, three small meat contest. And you one can argue the way we're trimming briskets anymore that the briskets are small meat too. 
you know, you don't need to cook these giant pieces of meat and you don't need to cook them for 12 hours to go cook a barbecue contest anymore. You can do all of, you can do a contest in five hours with the right equipment, the right know-how and the right temperature. So <laughs> one could argue that it's, that it's for small meats and is that good or bad? I don't, some people will make arguments either way. I think it's, I think it's good if you can cut down on food waste. I think it's good if you can um, involve more people. So I don't know, Luke, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's a kind of a non-issue because we're also going to go do it anyway. So I, and I really don't see how it changes everything. There's a lot of noise out there about how cooking a smaller thing really favors those that have catering companies or restaurants and everything. But how is that any different than it was before? You know, people still, if you owned a restaurant, you still have access to the 10 cases of butts that you ordered that week. Whereas if you don't have a restaurant, you still got to go out and find yours in a store. That hasn't changed. Um, is that an advantage? I don't know, maybe. But if you buy your meat right and you're dedicated enough, you can you can mitigate that circumstance. And, you know, and, and that's kind of what we've done. So, you know, it's, I just think there's a lot of, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting concept, but, but I don't think it really affects anything. Um, let's see here. I think we have one more question it's from Golden Blue Barbecue. Said, who is Luke's mentor or the most influential pit master he looks up to? Man, that is such a hard question now, given how many of these podcasts I've done and just how long it's been 10 years since we started this and how many people have helped me along the way. The list of people that have helped me along the way is tremendous. Um, and I don't really think that I can, I can really put it to one or two or five or, you know, I, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll go with three names that I'll, that I'll talk about. Uh, one would obviously be my friend Darren Warth with Iowa Smoky D's. Uh, he's really showed me a lot about mindset and competition barbecue and cooking on the Jambo. And, and, but also another thing is that how influential and, um, how much of a mentor he's been in the barbecue business side of things. And the same I could say for Joe Pierce. Uh, Joe Pierce with Slaps has helped me in both arenas as well. And I really think when you get into, into the business side of barbecue, it's there it's way more important to have great mentors. And having Joe and having Darren. And also, I would be remiss if I didn't put Tim Shear in there as well. Uh, probably one of the sharpest minds out there. Um, definitely the sharpest palate. And he's taught me more about what happens when that judge eats that piece of food. I don't know if he's knowingly done it, but <laughs> I've learned a lot from Tim on both sides, on the business side and on the, um, on the competition side. I mean, there's other people too, who really influenced me very early on Chris Hart with IQ uh, it was the first class that I took and the first person that ever blew my, my mind with the stuff that goes on in competition barbecue. Um, just showing just the little tips and tricks that you learn in your first class. Guys, if you, if you haven't taken a class, that first class from somebody that's won a bunch of stuff will change your trajectory in competition barbecue. It's not even close, man. If you've gone to a good class for that, then... The sky's the limit. And I would say the other one would be Donnie Bray. Um, Donnie Bray uh, from Warren County Pork Choppers. His class and, and the, just his mindset. And the stuff that he's talked about in terms of, you know, making sure you cook to a, to a, a flavor profile that the most people will enjoy. And I mean, those lessons are invaluable and worth every penny that I spent to go and take them. So... Uh, yeah, great question. And there's a lot of different answers there because there's a lot of different things and the list is definitely not complete. I'm sure there's people I'm leaving off that are going to tell me they're never going to help me again, but, um, 
you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, like get to know people and keep your ears open and you can really learn. So I think that wraps it up for our questions today. I really love doing these episodes. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you check out barbecuedata.com. Make sure you check out the KC barbecue store.com Kansas city barbecue store. And, uh, again, thank you guys so much and look forward to a summer of just some incredible content from current pit masters, pat past pit masters, teammates, we're going to have a lot of great stuff coming. So thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you out there. Thank you for listening to Pitmaster, an old Virginia Smoke podcast. Be sure to subscribe and like the podcast, rate the podcast, and to share it out with your friends. Also be sure to check out the old Virginia Smoke TikTok as well. Old Virginia Smoke, one word. That's all you have to search for. It's hilarious. Tune in next week for another great episode of Pitmaster. For companies interested in advertising, please contact Old Virginia Smoke directly via www.oldvirginiasmoke.com. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is edited by Chris Sedanka. Pitmaster, an Old Virginia Smoke podcast, is a property of Old Virginia Smoke, LLC. All rights reserved. Copyright 2022. Old Virginia Smoke.